Good morning everyone, good to be with you today. I'm going to be presenting now on engineering a fire safe world, but with a specific emphasis, just looking at research, maths and science, physics, and how do we apply what we're learning to the real world? How do we make a difference as researchers? And how can we encourage you as the, the next generation to follow through, get involved at the research institutions, the universities, whatever it is, and start taking the, the maths and science and what all the rest of the subjects you're learning at school and, and making a difference with them in this world. I'm Professor Richard Walls from Stellenbosch University and I'll be talking about the research that we've been involved with and the various things uh, my team has been up to. So a couple of the, the topics going to be uh, answering today that have been, been put to me to discuss about. Firstly, just looking at uh, educational background of myself, uh, what being a researcher means and how you might become one. So if for any of you that are interested, then what uh, what did you do in the type of um, research we're presenting on? So look at my, my, the work of myself and my team. And then how does research affect and assist communities? Because it doesn't matter what you do, if it's not useful, it doesn't really matter. So how can we actually do work that makes an impact in the world around us, both in our community in South Africa and beyond? And then further, um, where would you like to take the application of this research to? So how can we as Stellenbosch University apply what we're doing to to everyone around us. And then lastly, some words of encouragement and motivation to you as the next generation coming through and hopefully coming to join us in, in the next future. Now, just a quick overview of myself. Um, background, so started out at WITS, did my bachelor's, master's and postgraduate diploma at WITS and then a, a bachelor's in theology part-time while uh, doing the other degrees and then went on to, to PhD at Stellenbosch and then also worked in industry for a couple of years before joining the university. Now, let's start having a look at some of these, these important questions. Now, what does research, what does being a researcher mean? And it's a very sort of open topic and it'll look different for every single person. A researcher in medicine may look very different to research in engineering, look very um, different to a researcher in IT. But let's start having a look, how do we apply it? Well, firstly, we're trying to find new ways to understand or solve problems that face the world. And uh, for instance, as an engineer, using physics, experiments, application of research by others, etc., to develop our knowledge regarding specific issues. For instance, here's a problem on the screen. You'll see some, some pictures of what's called eco-bricks. Many of you may have even collected these. You've got two litre Coke bottles, you shove them full of non-recycled plastic, and then people are building houses with these. So you've got thousands of houses, schools, creches being built out of these things. But the question is, are they safe? Are they fire safe? Can we use them? Should we use them or should we not? So that's one of the things we've started looking at recently. And we can then go and start looking at how do we solve a problem like this, a new problem facing the world. How do we apply what we're doing to, to this specific problem? Another problem that, for instance, we could look at it as a researcher and, and then specifically with myself and, and fire engineering. Here is some pictures from the Nisner fire disaster. Now, Nisner fire, a thousand homes burnt down. Number of deaths, this was one of the biggest fire disasters in South African history. You had billions of rands being lost in, in home damage, insurance claims, lost of life well, and businesses and also the real carnage absolutely destroyed a large part of, of Neisner. Now, how do we start learning from these, these incidents and then being more prepared in the future. Because this will not be the last Neisner. There will be another Neisner somewhere where 10, 100, 1,000 homes are going to be burnt down in some of our communities. So can we understand those? Can we apply what we know? And how do we make our homes more fire safe? Can we make sure that your home next to the, the wildland, next to the felt, doesn't burn down when the fire comes through? Then, firstly, what I need to, to discuss with you today is what is fire engineering? So I'm going to talk about quite a bit about this thing called fire engineering, fire protection engineering, fire safety engineering. There's lots of different terms. And now I'm actually not from a, I suppose, fire engineering background. I'm actually a structural engineer first and foremost. And then got into fire engineering by trying to make buildings safer through my PhD and then through research and students, etc. But let's have, a look. let's have a look at the definition. What is fire engineering? The application of scientific and engineering principles, so you've got to understand the principles, rules, which are in our codes, and expert judgment based on an understanding of the phenomena and effects of fire 
and of the reaction and behavior of people to fire to protect people, property, and the environment from the destructive effects of fire. Fires happen. They burn things down, ranging from your bry, maybe it gets knocked over and gets damaged, through to your home, through to entire factories, through to huge wildland areas, through to factories, through to all sorts of things, through to power stations, etc., etc. Our job as fire engineers, how do we keep the world safe? How do we make sure that when, not if, a fire breaks out, it's not going to destroy our power lines so we still have power? How do we make sure it doesn't destroy the new construction system? How do we make sure that that new cladding material we're putting on houses isn't going to be a fire hazard, um, but will actually prevent spread rather than encourage spread? And then various aspects to it. For instance, you've got to understand human behavior. When a fire breaks out in your school right now, look around you. How would you get everyone out in time? Do you have enough escape routes? Are there enough doors? Are those doors signposted? Once upon a time, a fire protection specialist, hopefully, um, looked at your school hall where you are probably sitting right now, or wherever you are, and said, can we make sure that the couple of hundred people sitting there can escape in case of emergency? And now, what happens if it was a 50-story building? Can you make sure everyone escapes in time? Then there's one, now that the fire is broken out, can you use fire protection systems to put the fire out, to detect the fire, to know where the fire is and to send the fire department or the sprinklers or whatever in the right direction to deal with the fire? Uh, do we, can we do an analysis of the whole system and understand risks and problems? And then also at the background, what's our science? Do we know how things burn, how fast they burn, how they spread, what ignites, what doesn't ignite? And so that is, is our job. And uh, if you have a look at when fire engineering goes pear-shaped, when it doesn't quite work out, is when we don't apply our physics, our code, our knowledge. This is the, the Grenfell Tower on the, the screen. 72 people died in one office block. This is one of the, the biggest fires outside of wartime in the UK in terms of buildings. 72 people dead. It is now a total mess. Everyone's suing everyone. There's lots of blame game going on. The problem is that the facade, the outer cladding of the building was flammable. So once the fire started, it just spread everywhere. And there were certain things that they, they never realized this was going to happen, so their policy was stay where you are, don't try to escape. And so many people, when they tried to escape, well, no, no, stay where you are, you'll come get rescued. And some people never got rescued, they died. So how do we understand these things, and how do we prevent a grandfall from happening again? Because it's very likely if we don't understand construction products and, and all sorts of other things. So that is really, though, on the higher end. That is a multi-million rand, you know, big block of flats, or it could be a fancy uh, a new office park for someone. But there's the, the other types of homes burning down, and our team has been extremely involved in informal settlements. Now, um, have a look. This is a, a video. This is a very small dwelling, um, informal dwelling. I've got sometimes people call them shacks, various other names. And this is just a little bit of timber burning inside. And what you quickly see, it doesn't take long. Fire develops. Now we get to what's called flashover where the entire room is, is full. There's flame everywhere, somewhere between 600 and 1,000 degrees Celsius. And now, in our experiments, that um, fully developed flashover scenario, that can happen in a minute. If you have, for instance, a paraffin stove, knock it over, it gets knocked onto maybe uh, the, 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 some linen, some bed clothes, you maybe have a minute before you're dead. That's how fast these fires can move. Sometimes it takes a lot longer. Sometimes maybe you fall asleep on the sofa and you know it's a cigarette and it smolders away. Maybe you don't even have flames, but you might be dead from the smoke you, you've breathed in, the asphyxiation. So all of these are dangerous, but dangerous in different ways. And we need to understand them to start guard for them because maybe we're designing smoke alarm. If our smoke alarm only detects certain things, maybe it'll go off too fast and annoy everyone. It'll go off too slowly and not work. So, there are a lot of things we have to think about when looking at these different inventors. But now that, let's say, we've, we've burnt down one home, how do we apply that to more? So, what we do is, as researchers, we start burning down more homes. So, this is, this is a, a PhD student of mine, Antonio Ciccione, now Dr. Ciccione. He did a lot of burning of homes in his PhD. Between the two of us, we have burnt down 70 homes each. Well, many of those overlapping. And, uh, here are three timber-clad dwellings, and what's happening is the first one's been lit, the temperature's on, shown on the top, 
quickly then ignited, then the, the, the fire spreads across the inside. Now it jumps to the second one. And as soon as the lining ignites, you'll see the fire suddenly drop and everything burst into flames. And the temperatures are now at about 1,000 degrees. The fire now jumps to the third one and moves across. And this isn't a matter of minutes. Third one ignites inside and outside and, and is on fire. At this point in time, there was a, a fire tornado, a fire whirl of about two to three meter diameter burning, you know, pouring out of the, the dwelling and would have really caused rapid spread from one dwelling to the next, to the next, to the next. And before you know it, you've got from one to 50 homes that are, that are on fire. And so, as you can see, you can start seeing how do you apply research. First, we understand one. Now we understand three. Now let's start seeing where we would, would take this to. As, as we start answering the questions that have been, been put to me today. So, I've been talking about research all along the way, but how do, we, how do you become a researcher? Let's say you're interested in, you enjoy maths, physics, biology, whatever it is, geography, and you want to go in this, in this region in the future. There are various options, firstly. Um, it's very important to get involved at one of the research institutions. A lot of it is through universities. But don't just be limited to the to universities. There can be research institutes, uh, the CSIR, there's various medical research institutes around the world. Um, some companies even have uh, research and development departments. They do a lot of interesting work, whether it's on electronic components or medical devices or construction materials and making better bricks. There are lots of different places you can get involved. And then you can even become involved by a consulting company. Some consultants, some, especially the bigger consultants, have specialized R&D research um, divisions, but it ranges from company to company. Now, normally a postgraduate degree is needed, a master's, or well, minimum honors, master's, often PhD. Depends where you are, depends what you're doing. The higher the degree, the more research you normally get involved with, but it depends on, on where you're going, where you're involved with. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately there's going to be a couple of years you're interested, you want to, play, you want to burn things down, uh, you want to go find a cure to cancer or TB or whatever it is, you're going to need a, a, quite a bit of training first, but keep, keep at it, you'll get there. Um, then you need to develop knowledge in a specific field. That might even be rocks, it might be timber, it might be whatever it is. Develop a knowledge in a field that you can then contribute to that field. And then beyond that, you start getting involved in national, international level, sharing information, learning from each other, applying it. So, those are the... the, the various ways you start getting involved in research and as I said multiple groups but keep your eyes open because often we think it's only the universities but maybe there's some other exciting opportunities you can go involved with. So moving moving along why do why did you do this type of research? So this is now for me personally why do I do what I do for various reasons um, I mean I'm out of a, a structural engineering background and um, it, it does make a difference in, in multiple um, fields. Burning things down actually can help make safe everything from a wine storage facility to informed settlement to a power station. It overlaps with a lot of different fields. And so that, that I find quite exciting. I get to burn stuff. Not many people get paid to destroy things on a regular basis, but I do. Um, so we, we burn down um, informal dwellings. We, we um, burn down timber things. We burn, uh, burn steel structures, timber structures, all sorts of things. As I was showing you pictures of, of re, um, plastic structures, eco bricks, and then applying that knowledge to, to make the world a safer place. And then also, I mean, the, one of the reasons got involved with the, the informal dwellings, I mean, Proverbs 14.23, kindness shown to the poor is an act of worship. Hopefully, I feel it follows the biblical guidelines of, of serving the poor and serving those, those around me. Then um, academic reasons, why do we get involved in fire? Because we were one of the first groups to actively pursue fire research. Well, there are not many people in, in this country and this continent. So there was a real gap. And that's what you'd want to do as a researcher. Where is there not knowledge where we need knowledge? Where's there a problem which isn't being solved? Where is there a field? I mean, this might be anything from green buildings to electrical supply to whatever it is. That we need skills. We need knowledge. And that's where it's a great place to start out in, in research. Many um, research opportunities, and then reasons for the profession is that we started a fire research group to try to develop the lack of engineers. There is an absolute, absolute shortage of fire engineers in this country. Every single school, office block, power station, um, you name it, needs this, this strange person called a fire engineer. 
to look at the plans, pick the materials, make sure people can escape, and do all these things. And there's a very, 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 very big lack of people in this in this field. So that's why we started pursuing the development of fire engineering to make a, a difference. And we've even received international funding from um, the UK to make this possible because they saw the need on the entire continent, not just here, but um, continental wide. Then um, fire safety is a major challenge in South Africa. We put a lot of things burning people. Um, I'm sure you see on a regular basis in the news. Uh, it might be sometimes it's even students. Sometimes when students protest, they try to burn down our universities. Right through to, as I said, um, last year there was a big petrochemical facility, a big um, a refinery experienced some fires. So all these things we, we need to deal with. Then there's limited educational offerings and research flows into teaching. Once you've built the knowledge background, you can start teaching it as well. So we can develop courses on fire safety, fire behavior, fire dynamics, physics of fire, etc. So develop the core understanding, Put it through to courses and we can then start teaching at master's level and whatever other, other level working with industry to start building the knowledge and having an impact and so that's why these organizations itemba labs and the various other ones are, are, and the nrf etc are putting money into to research development to try and make uh, impact in that way amongst many others so now i was showing you now firstly a single dwelling that we burnt down and i showed you a triple dwelling now your research how do we understand big picture Especially, let's say, now in formal settlements. So I'm going to show you a, a large-scale experiment we did. 20 homes. And just keep an eye on the timeline, bottom, bottom right of the screen. So, here we have our, our experiment. Those four dwellings on the bottom of the screen where the stars were ignited. And roughly about a minute after we ignited it, they were on fire. Well, fully engulfed post-flash. Then it starts spreading to the, the second row of dwellings. They catch around about two, two and a half minutes. They then rapidly caught on fire. And these are full-scale dwellings, 2.4 by 3.6 meters. Then that jumps to the third line of dwellings. And suddenly, three and a half, four minutes. At about four minutes, you're almost, you're basically at the fourth line of dwellings. Fire keeps dwelling, it gets hotter, it's well over a thousand degrees in many places. Five minutes, you've hit all the way through to the fifth line of dwellings. Twenty homes, five minutes. Five minutes, maybe the fire brigade has been notified, maybe they're on their way. That's the sort of timeline we're talking about, how fast these fires move. And at least if we can understand the physics, we might say, yes, such and such an intervention will make this better or worse. But you'll see now we're going to speed it up a little bit more. Seven minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes, ten minutes. I mean, most of the homes have been collapsed by now. And in a, a rural area, the fire brigade department on a... a doing an excellent job may still be five to ten minutes from arriving at the scene. And so you'll see all the homes collapsing as they progressively burn out and that's pretty much all that's, that's left of this. And so I'm going to show you also now a side view of this experiment so you can see what this looked like, looked like in, in practice. Now also have at the back of your mind as you see these flames coming through. Do you think certain products would work if you put a paint on, a sealant on, a certain devices to improve the construction, do you think they would work? Do you think they would stop this fire from spreading? There you'll see flames, four meters, five meters, six meters, and it re really in a matter of minutes it pushes from the first to the last line. 20 homes gone. By 16, 18 minutes, virtually everything's on the ground. There's only about one home left standing. And uh, some of these homes were clad with co um, uh, timber on the outside, but most of them were just steel, corrugated iron sheets on the side and, and bottom. But the main thing was, is they were lined with cardboard. And that might say, well, well, so what? The first thing that is ignited is key. It doesn't matter if you have 10 kilograms or 50 kilograms of fuel in your home. What's often the most important is how easily does that first thing ignite? If it's curtains or cardboard or maybe you know, someone's got a draft so they shove some newspaper in there. If that ignites, the rest is history. Well, your home is now history because that little piece of newspaper that's stopping the wind blowing through ignites, spreads through the curtain and then through the rest of the home, no more home, then your neighbors are burning down after you. So understanding ignition mechanisms and the physics of when does something ignite can make a big difference because many times people will come to us and say, we've got a paint. Now, that's great. There's some, some excellent products out there that protect structural steel. 
can we paint this on a dwelling and will it make it fire safe? Well, you're going to protect the steel, but to be honest, you're not going to do anything to the home. Because you've painted the side, now there's a little gap. The fire comes through, it finds the gap, it ignites your curtains, and then the rest of your home's history. You've spent money on paint, but this paint did nothing. The fire retardant paint's often very ineffective if you don't look at the system. If you don't look at the science of why do things ignite, you may have just basically a waste of money on, on some sort of intervention. And so that's where research would come into it. And beyond that, we can even start applying this to, to computer models. Here's what's called computational fluid dynamics. This is modeling fire behavior. This was part of uh, one of my PhD student, Antonio's work again, and uh, modeled all the dwellings with the fuel inside and the cladding. And see, can we understand the, the fire behavior? Can we model it? Can we predict what happens? Can we see why did something ignite and why didn't it? Um, for instance, it's, you, you sometimes have weird things that happen. You can go after them, why did that happen? And you go back and you can figure it out. I mean, just as a, as a separate note, it was kind of amusing when that those 20 homes burned down. There was one home we thought, man, that home's going to get absolutely toasted. That's going to get, well, yeah, m m almost melt that steel it's so hot because there was four timber homes around it. We thought, well, those timber homes are really going to cook that home in the middle. But it was actually interesting afterwards, the four timber homes burnt so fast, they sucked up all the oxygen. The one we thought was going to get absolutely toasted didn't even burn. Well, it burnt the slowest because the oxygen couldn't get there. So and when there's no oxygen, you have no combustion. So sometimes you have to go back and think about these things afterwards when it wasn't quite what you expected, but you can then figure it out. And then beyond that, how do we apply this further? How do we start applying what we learned to other things. For instance, here is a new steel building. Those sort of beams with holes in are called cellular beams. This is a big steel structure. Um, they want to build multi-story buildings out of this. Innovative, no concrete, very quick to build. Is it safe? And one of the ways you need to do, well, one of the, the aspects you need to cover when designing a new building is fire safety. So we went and we built a really, really, really big furnace and we, we burnt it down. So, uh, and before we got that, you'll see on the right of your screen a, 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 a computer model that actually applied the temperatures and said, all right, how will this thing bend? What will buckle? What will be affected? And then try to, from the, that, understand um, what's being affected and, and how do we make sure it's going to be safe. As I said, once we had some analyses, we went through and we actually built this, this structure. Um, first got the steelwork in place, then put a bunch of cladding and the boards and everything around it, ran a furnace test, and that's actually looking inside the furnace. Um, uh, we did it at our local testing lab, it was testing, and we ran a, a furnace for an hour on the structure and it actually survived quite well. So now we know this is maybe a good idea. This is moving towards, this is a fire safe building, or fire, face, fire safe construction system. But also one or two things happened with, oh, we need to fix that, or we can improve on that. And then we're now continuing up. This is part of another PhD student's work, Jalil, and he's now trying to make this the structure safe in terms of fire. Then, then moving on, say, what about those eco bricks I introduced you to earlier? Because people are building hundreds, thousands of these things all over, especially in Guatemala and um, charities and NGOs, they're, they're putting these things up. Are they fire safe? Well, I'm not going to give you a direct yes or no answer today. We're still busy with all the data analyses. But we actually put them in a furnace. We once again went, went to our local test lab, worked with them, built a number of samples. And on the screen you'll see now, during a test, the good thing is they were a lot better than we expected. When the fire was exposed, we expected there just to be flames and the whole thing to burn and etc. But what we actually found is as the heat penetrated through, it just melted and kind of melted away. So we didn't have huge flames and a spectacular you know, destruction of the wall. But at the same time, when plastics burn, and who knows what someone, you've got a two liter bottle and just about anything you name it can be found in there, from plastics to polystyrenes to who knows what else. And, uh, but you do have noxious fumes. You've got some really, really nasty poisonous fumes being, being liberated. So you have to ask yourself a question, is this safe? Well, it depends on what you're doing with it. Maybe for a single story building where if there's fumes, everyone's escaped, it's not a big deal. If this is a multi-story building, and now it's letting off fumes and people are trying to escape past that on the second floor, maybe that's a bad idea. So, some more work needs to be done to understand that, especially the, the, the gases that come from these, and then what happens 
Um, there's also, once the fire gets in there, it can just burn away from ages and ages and ages. And is it safe when the fire department arrives and they actually can't get to the fire? The fire is now burning inside the wall. Could that be a problem? Or how do we make sure that the fire doesn't get into the wall? So these are the sorts of things that we, we need to answer. On, on the right of the screen now, you'll actually see a um, thermal imaging camera picture. So that's a, a camera, kind of like you have at your schools, where they keep screening you and finding your temperature. It's just got lots of dots rather than a single dot. Um, and we could actually then see the heat of the sample and could, all right, it looks like that area is failing, that area is burning through, oh, that, that, that area still seems fine, and try to pick up what's, what's happening. And so you'll here you'll see some more pictures, and once again, there are the the gases coming through that I, I spoke about as the bottles burn, let's sort of gases. Um, and as it better than expected, quite a bit better than expected. Now the next phase is, is, is how do we roll this out safely in communities? Is it safe to be rolled out? What do we do with it? Because people are already building with it, but let's see now how do we deal with this and how do we, we make it safe? Um, here you can see one of the samples when there was actually a, a failure. This was after quite a bit of, of time. And then one of the bottles actually did catch a light. And you can see the flames coming out that top right corner. And then also the thermal imaging camera picking up the, the heat um, heat signature that, that you use. And so that's how uh, you'd apply your equipment and, and such. And what you do as you go is you've got what's called thermocouples. Little, almost they look like a wire. And they measure temperature. And you put these in all over the sample. And you can get temperatures out. And you go, OK, the front face is now at 700. Ooh, that bottle on the inside, that's 500. That's not good. That means it's probably burning. Uh, and so you, you get data out of it that you can use to, to make decisions with them and see what's happening. So how does research affect communities? I'm waffling on talking all sorts about testing and bricks and or plastic bricks and various things. How does um, research affect communities? And it's a slow process. Firstly, we provide guidance on how homes, construction systems, communities, and wildland urban interface, you know, when your home is next to the, the felt, the forest, the mountain, whatever it is, we provide guidance on how homes, construction systems, community, and wildland urban interface communities can be made safer for fires. How do you look at your home and make it safer if there is a big forest next to one of those? When it burns down, it could come knocking on your door and, and destroy your home. Um, we've take research and then try to distill it out. It's all very fine and dandy, having beautiful graphs and computational fluid dynamic models and temperature outputs and heat fluxes and all this sort of stuff. But the people doing excellent work on the front lines, your, your NGOs, your governments, your schools, your engineers, they have to apply it. So can you take it from a bunch of just science and make it useful for someone? And so, uh, for instance, we tried to do it. We, we produced a book on informal settlement fire safety, informal settlement guideline. Taking all the research we've done, but not written for a bunch of scientists, written for the people who actually matter on the front line, working in the communities, making a difference, be it fire departments or wherever else. Um, you may need to work with government, um, government departments, Department of Human Settlements, or the, the fire departments, or whoever it is, try to work with them to, to get into communities or um, industrial facilities or whatever it is. Then um, provide input on construction systems. They are codes of practice to keep our country safe. Those codes of practice need to reflect the latest developments. So to provide input on those sorts of codes and standards. And then also identify risky products and systems. Sometimes the people are selling things and you say, Oi, uh -uh, this doesn't work. Sorry, you shouldn't be selling product X for, for use in this, uh, this field. We've had it before where we're burning down a dwelling and we try to test, for instance, the pressure product. And uh, we're burning down an informal dwelling and there's a product that people have been selling to the local mayor and they did a great presentation. They had a fire and they killed the fire with their gadget, gizmo, whatever it is. The mayor goes, that's great, I'll buy 10,000 and he issues it to the community. But has it been tested? So we go and we test it, we get that gadget, we set up a fire, we burn down the dwelling, we start throwing these things. And uh, one day we threw 24, at, I think it was about 400 rand each. So we threw 10,000 rands worth of product at a home, didn't even slow it down. And we said, guys, sorry, uh -uh. for post flash over big fire, this doesn't work. Small fire, maybe. You know, if you're, um, something's burning on the stove, but also you might throw it and then you'll just throw um, boiling oil all over your home and it'll just cause more of a fire by throwing it. So 
that's where testing research and development coming in. So good intentions, the local mayor may have done the best that he thought he could, but it's good when there's some testing to back it up. So um, those are various things. Now look, how does research affect communities? We're going to have a look at a couple of, of case studies now. For instance, here is the Neisner fire disaster, which I, I mentioned earlier. And this is work I'm going to show you now by my colleagues at the CSIR. Uh, and uh, they've done a lot of interesting work, a lot of excellent satellite mapping. And as a thousand homes, huge fire, billions of rands worth of damage. But what's very interesting is you start understanding this incident. Because there was actually three fires. Well, two, probably a third fire that started and all came together. It caused this carnage, absolute chaos. Um, first fire started at half past three on the 7th of June. Second fire started at about 5 a.m. on the, um, but it had been ignited months before and was slowly burning through the undergrowth. There was a lot of thick um, undergrowth and it was just sort of smoldering there for months. And then suddenly the wind pushed through and fire jumped up. And then uh, there may have actually been a third ignition um, that's difficult to determine, but probably around the eyes and the heads that occurred. But that. Between the three of them, they, the fire started one side of Nisen, and if you know the area, pushed all the way through Nisen, all the way through to Plint. And a thousand homes later, um, it stopped. And so, there's some very interesting lessons we can learn from this. Firstly, um, there were spot fires up to 2.6 kilometers ahead of the fire front. Now, what is a spot fire? Now, here is a satellite image that they got just at the right time. We just, this was a perfect overpass of the satellite and it got it for the CSI spot on. Now on the left hand side you've got the fire burning. On the right hand side a fire suddenly starts. 2.6 kilometers from where the fire is burning. What happened was the wind was pumping through there. And what happens is you've got these lots of little particles, um, twigs, leaves, whatever's on fire, but the small light stuff and it's burning, burning, burning. And it's just blown. And thousands of these things rain down now and might be raining down on your home, might be raining down on the forest, might be jumping a river. And it just keeps blowing and blowing and blowing. And some of the bigger ones will um, manage to get 2.6 kilometers, land on something and cause a fire there. So, a 20 meter fire break may not save your home. If you're in an area, often you have homes and you've got the mountain and then they have this thing called a fire break. And it's great to have it, I encourage them, they're very good. 20 meters may not save you when 2.6 kilometers was not enough. So, what does it land on? And when it lands, can it ignite? The chances are whether your home will ignite or not may be the fact that you have leaves in your gutters. If you cleaned out your gutters just before the fire came through, maybe the difference between your home burned down or not. And uh, silly things like that. You have light, easily ignitable items all the way around your home. So those sorts of things can make a big difference. And looking through just at the, the small details, do you have a, a patio, a deck, lots of timber slats, and then the, the little brands, these thousands of raining embers can fall down, find some old leaves, ignite those, and then suddenly your home's gone. And even if your home is brick with steel sheeting, you always have a window. There's always a weak point of entry for the fire. And so, for instance, for Neisner, what we did is we, we did an analysis of, of the thousand homes that were burnt down. Going through now, how did it come through? What burnt down? Why? And, and how can we learn from this in the future? So on the screen, you'll see how the, the fire actually moved from the top left to the bottom right. And the different arrows where the ember attack, where these little embers come raining down. Um, fire spread through vegetation and just burnt continuously through the trees and grass and whatever else there was. And then also structure to structure. Your house may become fuel. Your home, you leave the window open, some brands land in, your curtains ignite, your, your house catches fire. It now jumps to your neighbor's home. So you think of your house as a house, your house may be fuel. And your fuel will then cause your neighbor's home to ignite if your home is not fiery. And so large areas were ignited. And as I said, we always think about the left-hand diagram, the, the big flames and what's called convective and radiative heating. Radiation, electromagnetic waves, they can travel through a vacuum. Uh, then you've got convective, hot gases rising. We normally think it's sort of these flames and pushing through that overnight our homes. But often it's actually the right-hand side, the, the, the brands, the flaming little pieces that are the big damage. They're often very dominant in, in home survival versus not. And that's where the, the science and physics come in. 
And we can apply the same thing to informal settlement dwellings. This is, this is a figure from, from the book we've just um, published to try guide people in terms of, of looking at interventions. And you've got a home. How might, it have, how might it ignite? Well, firstly, you've got what's called flame impingement. The flames come up, and they will try to find those holes that I spoke about earlier. They're going to try ignite your cardboard, your newspaper, your curtains, whatever it is, and spread through your home. So flame impingement, very important. Electromagnetic radiation also. Flames are coming out of a window and then they radiate and they can jump a distance. If there's enough radiation onto your home, you may ignite spontaneously. It may, the radiation heats up something and suddenly it catches fire. And that can happen at three meters. You normally need at least about two and a half to three meters, sometimes more, four or five meters to prevent um, radiation causing ignition. You can have branding, raining down. If you've got just rubbish and cardboard and tires and stuff stacked next to your home, you've got a fire bridge. Move them out the way, because otherwise the fire might move them out the way for you. So, when it comes to, to applying these, now let's say you're a municipality. As you start understanding the big picture and, and understanding the incident, you can start now seeing how do we deal with this. And so from the, this is a, a um, uh, incident timeline, where time is of the essence. From its starting, the fire progressively increases that, that orange graph, and there's a lot of things that happen. And when you understand that 20 homes can be ignited in five minutes, time is key. We've got to get our fire department there as soon as possible. We've got to get people with buckets of water there as soon as possible. And if you start understanding the timeline, there's a lot of steps in the way. Any of them going wrong will be a problem. Any of them being delayed by three minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes will cause 20, 50, 100 more homes to, to be ignited. So we need to make sure people phone the right number. If people are not phoning the right number, we're in trouble. So um, the, often people phone 10111. The police don't put out fires. Police are great, we love the police, but they don't put out fires. You need to phone the local fire department. Silly things like that are applications of research identifying where's the problem and, and how do we, do we deal with it. So now, the final um, aspect we're going to be talking through is application of research. And I've, I've been mentioning throughout, in all sorts of ways, we apply it to informed homes, we apply it to uh, petrochemical facilities, plastic bottles, whatever it is. So, application of our research as a team, and once it's, it's, it's not just myself, we've got a whole team of, of engineers, PhD students, master's students, postdocs, working together, working on these these topics to make all of this possible and to try and make a difference. So, um, as I said, informal settlements, can we guide what's happening? We're not going to solve the problem. While we have informal settlements, they're going to keep burning. But at least, instead of losing a thousand homes, maybe we lose a hundred homes. In ten fires, maybe we can get down to five fires. And so that's where, hopefully, a difference can be made. New construction materials. So someone comes along, product, can we test it, can we look at it, can we prevent another Grenfell Tower where 72 people died uh, in a big fire incident. Are we going to have a Grenfell in South Africa? Maybe. I don't know. I hope not, but there's, these things do happen. Um, petrochemical facilities. We have a lot of oil, diesel, petrol um, being stored around. Uh, and protecting them is, is key. Um, and there's a lot of very expensive systems going into protecting those and the engineers out there designing facilities for petrochemical facilities are doing a very important job to make sure we have fuel for our vehicles and, and a safe environment. Now, um, wildland fires, looking as I've been speaking the whole way along, keeping your, safe, your home safe from wildland fires. Uh, fire departments working with, I love fire departments, firefighters are great. Um, I have a four-year-old son and to to him, I would be so much cooler if I was a firefighter. Engineers are boring to a four-year-old, but firefighters, man, to a four-year-old, they are awesome. And uh, they, they do a lot of good. They put their lives on the risk. But how can we support them um, doing the, the excellent jobs that they do? Then structural engineering. Uh, I'm a structural engineer, first and foremost, and then got into to, um, fire after that. Just remember, you're not stuck in one career. You may end up moving around as, as time goes by. And then research leading to, to education. So, um, mentioned earlier, there's a fire safety engineering book. That would be research into the hands of those people on the front line doing the, the most important work. What about manufacturing? Here is a facility that was um, built 
to manufacture trains. And the question came up, if a train caught fire, let's say now they're building a train, or a carriage of a train and caught fire, is this building going to collapse? Is the roof safe? And so we, we created um, uh, computational fluid dynamic models, so just model you know, what happens with the hot gases going up, spreading across the roof. At, and this is a very big fire. This is what's called a sort of 30 or 35 megawatt fire. It's a very, very big fire. Normal fires are like 5 megawatts. Um, surprisingly enough, the roof was safe. Because it was so high, as the hot gases went up, they sucked in a lot of cool gases. So it was 1,000 degrees at the train, but five stories later, because it was a really, really, really high roof, it sucked in enough um, cold gases that it was only a couple of hundred degrees Celsius at the roof. And now steel only loses temperature of about 400 degrees Celsius. So up to 400 degrees, steel is fine. It doesn't even get affected. So now suddenly, yes, we've got a big fire, but at the roof, it's 300, 250 degrees Celsius. We have nothing to worry about. So those sorts of things are, are ways we start going to solve industrial um, problems. And that can save a lot of money to your client. Maybe doesn't now have to change their roof or protect their roof with expensive um, materials. Other things, developing educational courses. Um, research goes into education, and then education goes to the front lines through our engineers, through our consultants, through our practitioners or firefighters, whoever it is, and they make the difference. Um, the research is often in the background, allowing the people on the front lines to, to have that impact. Um, even though applications of research, this is not my work, this is from the um, University of Greenwich, but I just thought it might be an interesting thing, thing in closing. What are the applications of research? How do we understand what happens in incident? This was a major nightclub disaster where a lot of people died. And a, a group of researchers tried to understand this afterwards to see what happened. Now, in this video, what happened, the, the, the people, those are all the little people in a computer simulation. There was a fire breaking out in this this nightclub, and then the, the gases are pro um, progressively lowering, and people were fleeing, got stuck at the exit, stuck at the door, stuck in various places, and you'll actually see them starting to die now. As the, the, the bodies change, that's where most of the bodies were actually found. And they were able to develop computer simulations of this. This was a disaster, but next time can we prevent it? Next time when there's a nightclub disaster, can we make sure that there were enough escapes to, to make sure it's happening? That's why there's some really annoying rules and regulations about fire escapes and this and that to make sure we don't have another one of those disasters. And that's often where those rules and regulations come from. So, some final words of encouragement. Um, there's a fascinating world of professions, topics, and fields out there. There are fields that you have no idea about right now that you may be in in 20 years from now, or five years from now. And... Uh, Firstly, science, maths, and all the other scientific, by science I mean your geography and biology, all of them, very important. Um, they're the basis for problem solving. Uh, and you burn down the dwelling. To understand why something ignited, you have to have the physics in the background and the maths in the background to work it out. So you can say to Mr. Fire Department, no, this is a bad idea, that paint's not going to work because of X, Y, and Z. So those subjects you're doing now, they're very important. Um, one thing, look outside of traditional fields. Doctors, lawyers, accountants, those are great, very important fields. Excellent. But there's a lot of new emerging fields, be it in IT and engineering and etc. out there. Go have a look into those. We need good people in a lot of different fields. Um, within engineering, you think of engineers as a structural engineer and a mechanical engineer and a chemical engineer. Within those fields, there are things you did not even know existed there where lots of cool things are being done. So keep your eyes out, get into it, but also get good training and qualifications and work really hard. Do your best. If you don't have the, the um, privilege to go to university, you can still make a big difference. Wherever you are, get as much training, as much education through your company, through wherever you work, work hard. And you'll be able to gradually build up and make a difference where, where you, uh, wherever you are. Many opportunities are available. Hard work's going to need them to, to open those doors. And um, it is possible to make a difference. Often making a difference does not feel warm and fuzzy. Um, going and doing research and then producing guidelines is often a very boring, laborious task. And then it gets, goes to the front line and the people on the front lines make the difference. It's a very slow process. You may, people sometimes have this sort of magical view, like helping the world is I've got to be feeding the homeless on every corner, which is fantastic. Please do that. 
at the same time, making a difference, maybe writing documents, maybe publishing papers, maybe solving problems of particle accelerators or whatever it is, um, and then your work can be taken forward and make a difference in producing medicines or just yeah, helping educate people. So with that, I'd like to close off. Hope you've enjoyed it today. I hope I haven't been too boring. Hope you find some interesting things that you're, you can trust your physics teacher that are teaching you stuff that you maybe can use in the future. Um, same with maths. might look boring now, but there's some very cool applications of it. Hope you've had a good day. And yeah, all the best. Hopefully see some of you guys in the future. Thanks. Cheers.